Hello and welcome to the RT Sports Show. Half an hour of the week's best sport with me, Kate Partridge, and here's some of what's to come. Start of the road as FIFA bosses visit Russia's first completed World Cup stadium in Kazan. We talk to the man in charge of delivering the showpiece football tournament in 2018. While leagues apart as NHL star goaltender Semyon Valamov faces charges of domestic violence, a Canadian goalie helps Spartak Moscow boost their fortunes in the KHL. And seal of approval as Russia marks 100 days to go before their first Winter Games, new Olympic boss Thomas Bach praises Sochi during his first visit to the city. But let's start with football as Russian champions Tesco Moscow were handed a partial stadium ban by UEFA following allegations of racist chanting during a Champions League match. A section of the Himki Arena will be closed when the army men host Bayern Munich on November the 27th. The decision came after Manchester City midfielder Yaya Toure complained he was racially abused by some of the crowd during City's 2-1 win at Tesco last month. The Ivory Coast star also suggested black players should boycott the 2018 World World Cup in Russia, but former Liverpool and England star John Barnes says fines and sanctions alone won't eradicate racism. So the only way to get rid of it is through education, through explaining to people why it's wrong to feel the way they do, why it's wrong to have this, that perspective on somebody else. And no one has ever done that. All they're doing is saying, when you say we're going to find you. So, is that going to get rid of racism? That's not going to get rid of racism. What it'll do is, maybe they'll kick CSK and Moscow out, I don't know, maybe they close the stadium, but you'll still have a lot of racism. That's not the way to get rid of it. Well, meanwhile, Spartak Moscow were given a two-match domestic stadium ban after crowd trouble marred last Wednesday's 1-0 victory at second tier Shinik in the last 32 of the Cup. Riot police used water cannon before detaining 30 fans. The third place Red and Whites will host league leader Zenit behind closed doors next Sunday. While elsewhere, FIFA Secretary-General Jerome Valka praised Russia's progress ahead of staging the World Cup in 2018. The top official visited Kazan, 700 kilometres east of Moscow, to meet the local organisers and assess the Kazan Arena, the first completed of 12 new stadiums which will host the flagship event. And Valka also congratulated Russia on reaching next summer's World Cup in Brazil after winning Group F ahead of Cristiano Ronaldo's Portugal. By the way, we FIFA are very, very happy that Russia qualified because it's important that Russia will play in Brazil before playing as a host the 2018 FIFA World Cup here in Russia. As I said before, there are 300 projects, ongoing projects in Russia. There is uh, no delay in this project. We have seen the first stadiums uh, with Kazan. And all those issues from an eventful week in Russian football I raised with the man in charge of producing the 2018 World Cup. As Russia prepares to host the first such showpiece in Eastern Europe and one the organisers hope will leave a lasting legacy. 2018 FIFA World Cup, ladies and gentlemen, will be organised in <laughs> Russia. December the 2nd, 2010. Football history was made. For the first time in 88 years, FIFA will hold the world's biggest tournament in the world's biggest country, as football's governing bodies aim to make the world's game a global festival. It can offer a new territory, it can offer a totally new world and a totally new market. Chief Executive Alexis Sorokin is tasked with delivering Eastern Europe's first World Cup. Poland and Ukraine were similar pioneers as hosts of Euro 2012, while Brazil is now braced for FIFA's top show for the first time since 1950, and Russia will use the experiences of each to ensure the success of 2018. Euro was valuable for us because it's a, it's a country, or actually there are two countries that are nearby, that are the one country we share the mentality with, another to a certain extent also. So some, some issues that were there uh, we think are pertinent here as well. But uh, the, very, the very essence of the World Cup, of course, will be picked up in Brazil. 
Russia's proximity to Central Europe, cheap flights and visa-free travel are hoped to fill a third of the stadiums in the 11 host cities with foreign fans. While the country is also keen to show the recent furore over anti-gay propaganda laws and reports of alleged racism have been misrepresented. We think part of the problem is that we are not um, open enough. We did not explain enough what is going on here particularly with the, with the law that you referred to, uh, there is a lack of, uh, of general knowledge of what the law is about. And it's basically about uh, people not willing to allow certain materials to be uh, propagated among youngsters. That's what it's about. It's not about fighting the gay movement. Uh, it's pretty far from that, actually. In terms of racism, it's a, it's a difficult issue because uh, it's a universal thing. It exists to a certain extent everywhere. And so we, we together with the Russian Football Union, are doing the best we can to, to offstand and to, uh, to mitigate this. But we cannot eradicate it overnight. And it's not just about changing attitudes. $20 billion are being invested into overhauling World Cup-related infrastructure, while seven of the 12 mainly brand-new arenas will become home to local teams to boost flagging league crowds and commercialism in Russian football. So, though economists claim host countries don't profit directly from big tournaments, Sorokin believes the indirect bonuses will benefit Russia during 2018 and beyond. It's material legacy and it's uh, so-called intangible legacy. Uh, material legacy is clear, it's the infrastructure, it's the new venues. Uh, without venues, it's, it's impossible to further develop. But, uh, but intangible is no less important. Is people, first of all, fired up for the idea of not only football, but sports in general. Uh, and it's clear that there are more people going in for sports after the after competitions like the World Cup in any country. While Brazil has been dogged by protests and delays, Russia remains on schedule with four stadia due to be finished by the end of this year. And as the official logo rightly reminds us, the country is all set and waiting for you to join the party. Kate Partridge, RT, Moscow. Now, former England captain David Beckham backed his country to do well at what he says will be an exceptional World Cup in Brazil. The Three Lions' most capped outfield player signed digital copies of his autobiography in London, as the 38-year-old also hopes to launch a major league soccer team in Miami. It's going to be a tough World Cup. I think it's going to be a great World Cup. I think it will be one of the most successful ones because Brazil is a country that loves football. Um, and I think the way they'll they'll go about this this World Cup will be special. While Brazil's World Cup hero Pelé was also in London, being honoured as England manager Roy Hodgson handed the only three-time winner the Legend of Football Award before the 72-year-old star made his predictions for next year's final. If it possible, the final Brazil and England. Okay. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Now on to ice hockey and Russia goaltender Semyon Valamov made 27 saves for the Colorado Avalanche just two days after spending a night in jail following charges of domestic violence. The 25-year-old appeared in court in Denver on Thursday after his model girlfriend claimed a drunk Valamov attacked her before throwing her out of their apartment. The goalie was released on bail but faces kidnapping and assault charges. The 2012 world champion has since helped the NHL leading Avalanche seal a 3 to overtime win at Dallas, but was on the bench for the 4-1 home route of the Montreal Canadiens. While Canadian goaltender Jeff Glass proved to be shatterproof after leading Spartak Moscow to a 1-0 home win over Amour, as his side goes into the KHL's international break with three wins from three. Konstantin Potapov reports. Spartak haven't enjoyed much success recently. They finished second bottom in the Western Conference last season and have missed out on the playoffs for the past two years. 
However, it seems things are looking brighter for the Moscow side with former player Fyodor Konarekin now in charge. After a recent run of five home matches, Spartak won the final three. Last Monday, they snatched a 5-4 overtime win over rock bottom Metalurk Novokuznetsk. Then, on Wednesday, the Red and Whites edged in form Sibir, Evgeny Kulik netting a power play winner in the second period. But the first star of the game was Canadian goaltender Jeff Glass, who was in inspired form between the pipes, denying his former side 26 shots. You know what? From here on out, there's not going to be any easy games. There's going to be pressure the whole way now. Um, it's going to be very tight, but um, I think our team likes that and we play better in the big games. So it was a big game today and we won and we're real happy. Spartak's roast is a mixture of youth and experience. Yet, despite having two-time Stanley Cup winning center Vyacheslav Kozlov plus former NHL forward Nikolai Zherdev, the Red and Whites are struggling to score goals. In Friday's gritty 1-0 victory over Amur, Viktor Bobrov reacted quickest in a late scramble, the referees using TV replays to confirm the goal. While 27-year-old Glass recorded his second straight shutout and fourth of the campaign, equaling last season's personal best in the KHL. We kind of knew going into this game it was going to be a low-scoring game, and uh, you know my job is to stop the puck. And uh, I, I thought that our team played great defense, and you know blocking shots is huge. They made my job easy, and I just had to make my saves. It's been a really tough series of home matches. I've just got my form back so I could do without the international break. But the other guys really need some rest, because after the break we have a crucial away run in Siberia and the Urals, and we need to be fully fit for that. The Amur victory was Spartak's third in a row and saw them climb to join fourth of the 14 teams in the West. The season is approaching its halfway mark, and despite the side's low-scoring stats, at least Gloss remains unbreakable and aims to help his team to book a playoff spot. Konstantin Batapov, RRT. To the rest of the best now and tennis world number two Novak Djokovic joined the elite club of only 15 players to have won 40 ATP titles. The Serbian battled back from a breakdown in both sets in Paris to outclass world number three and defending champion David Ferrer of Spain 7-5, 7-5. It was also a 16th Masters title for Djokovic as the 26-year-old boosted his slim chances of reclaiming the world top ranking from Rafael Nadal at the Tour Finals in London this week. While in the women's game, informed Simona Halep of Romania came from a set down to beat Australia's Sam Stoza 2-6, 6-2, 6-2 and win the year-ending Tournament of Champions in Bulgaria. It was the sixth WTA title for the 22-year-old, with Halep clinching all of them this season and rising to a career-high 11th in the world. While in Formula One, Ferrari band Kimi Raikkonen crashed out on the first lap at the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix after threatening a boycott earlier in the week. The Finn claiming his Lotus team haven't paid him a single euro all year. But it was seventh heaven for Sebastian Vettel as the newly crowned four-time champion eased to his seventh straight victory, matching the record set by fellow German Michael Schumacher in 2004. And the new NBA season got underway on Tuesday as two-time reigning champions, the Miami Heat, beat the Chicago Bulls 107 points to 95 on home court. The 2011 most valuable player, Derek Rose, played his first competitive game in 18 months for the Bulls after a long-term knee injury. Chicago's Carlos Boozer top scored with 31 points, but LeBron James sank 17, with six more players finishing in double digits for Miami to help them win the opener. While Russian champion Stezka Moscow suffered their worst EuroLeague defeat in 16 years and their first of the season as the Army men lost 86-60 at Fenerbahce in Istanbul. Bojan Bogdanovic posted a game-high 23 points to help the Turkish outfit maintain top spot in Group A. And there was also a first defeat for EuroLeague debutants Lokomotiv, who lost 73-58 to Maccabee in Krasnodar, as the Israeli side went top of Group D. Joe Inglis scored 14 points for the visitors and grabbed 10 rebounds to secure his first EuroLeague double-double. And that brings us to half-time in the sports show, but we'll be back kicking and punching in the second half, so don't go away.
and we're working very hard to make that work. Once again, we put something on the air. It's a flat out liar. Have you ever had sex with Governor Rick Perry? No, it's not it. I want you to watch what we're about to do because you've never seen anything like this on television. Shifting sands and alliances, advances and reversals, outside military interventions and stalemate. These are among some of the descriptions that apply to the Middle East since the start of the Arab Spring. What are we experiencing in this turbulent region? The end of the West's neo-colonial order or merely instability and violence with no end in sight? The Olympic torch is on its epic journey to Sochi. 123 days through 2,900 towns and cities of Russia, relayed by 14,000 people for 65,000 kilometers in a record-setting trip by land, air, sea, and outer space, Olympic Torch Relay on RT and RT.com. Welcome back to The Sports Show and let's resume with our regular look at mixed martial arts after UFC heavyweight star Alistair Overeem recently held a masterclass in Moscow and talked to Robert Vardanyan about his ultimate aims. The one and only. Often there's just a worn out cliche. But in fighter Alistair Overeem's case, it's an undisputed definition. The only man in the history of combat sports to hold champion's belts in mixed martial arts and kickboxing at the same time. The former Strike Force, Dream and K1 heavyweight champion, one of the most feared strikers in MMA, the demolition man whose full potential is still unknown. I find MMA more hard because it's more disciplined. You have to uh, you have more factors, the wrestling, the jiu-jitsu, uh, striking, there's more surprise uh, element in there. Um, but K1 also, of course, is I like striking, so of course I also like K1. But if I have to make a choice, it's, it would be MMA. And of course, I have a free championships belt. For me, only one remains, and that is the, the UFC belt. So this is my, my goal. With a total of 50 MMA belts on his CV, there is six of which he's won, the English born Dutchman lost his last two fights in the UFC. And his next bout against former champion Frank Mir in New Jersey on February the 1st is set to become a do or die matchup for them both. Nevertheless, the Reem believes he'll be back stronger. I think my career is like uh, everybody's life. In, in life you have ups and downs, in the career is the same, you have ups and downs, some periods that everything works, other periods uh, not everything works and you have setbacks. For me, it's, um, it's about two things. It's about always developing yourself, always um, yeah, stay optimistic and look for solutions. This, this attitude really helps me. Um, yeah, and then it's also about the journey. And the journey is you win, you lose, you travel, you meet people, uh, yeah, you're making a living life. His latest journey led the 33-year-old to Moscow, to one of the capital's best gyms, where he shared some of his skills and tips with Russian fans and revealed the only regret he has about his life in the sport. A missed dream fight against a now retired star, the man many still consider the greatest of all time. Looking back, there's one fight that I really wanted to make happen and I did my best and that was uh, to fight your champion, Fedor. Fedor Melenko. Uh, the fight unfortunately did not happen, but um, yeah, that was one fight that I wanted to happen. Over him is still on the way to his ultimate goal, the UFC champion's belt. And it would take a brave man to say that he won't wear it someday. Robert Ferdinand, RT. 
Now, top Olympic officials visited Sochi last week as Russia marked 100 days to go before hosting their first ever Winter Games next February. President Vladimir Putin welcomed President Thomas Bach as the German travelled to the Black Sea Resort for the first time since being elected head of the International Olympic Committee two months ago. The two presidents then took a ride on a train as they inspected the new Adler railway station. The transit hub is set to link the coastal cluster with the mountain venues during the Games. And to mark the 100 days to go milestone, large Olympic rings were put up at Sochi's railway station. The symbol represents all the flag colours from the original competing nations at the first modern games, all united in one Olympic movement. A similar set of rings was also installed near Sochi's airport earlier this year. While IOC boss Bach was also on hand to un help unveil the official outfit to be worn by volunteers and organisers during the Olympic and Paralympic Games. The kit has the trademark pattern of a patchwork quilt with traditional motifs from across Russia. 25,000 volunteers are due to work in Sochi in February and March. And Bach says the final run-up to the Games is always the most challenging part of the task. The staff of the organizing committee and uh, volunteers and many other people, they know about this and they are very dedicated and uh, committed. So based on what has been achieved uh, already in the last uh, the couple of uh, years, we can be very confident that also this uh, last lap, this last uh, 100 days uh, then will be successful. While the American Olympic Committee also celebrated 100 days to go until Sochi by taking over New York's Times Square. Olympic sports were on display at the world-famous crossroads with a mini ski slope and an ice rink, providing winter fun for the crowd in midtown Manhattan. While a couple of American Olympic champions, alpine skier Lindsay Vonn and figure skater Evan Lysacek, are both looking to shine in Sochi. I'm really hoping I can defend my Olympic title from Vancouver. Um, you know, obviously this has been the toughest journey for me so far coming back from this injury, but I've worked extremely hard. For me, I'm chasing a very lofty goal of trying to repeat as Olympic champion. Dick Button was the last man and the only American to ever do that in 1952, which uh, is proof that it's uh, quite a feat to accomplish. And Russia will also host their maiden Winter Paralympics at Sochi next March, aiming to finish one better than the second overall place achieved in Vancouver in 2010. And some potential medal winners were among those honoured at last Friday's annual Sporting Awards, as Michael Kravchenko reports. With less than 100 days to go until Russia's maiden Winter Olympics get underway in Sochi, the Paralympic community came together to mark another event, the 8th annual award ceremony to honor, support and recognize a year's achievements from the country's top athletes and trainers. We created these awards to help make Paralympic sports more popular. We don't have athlete or trainer of the year awards. Each nominee has their own background story. And we've picked the athletes not only with the best results, but also whose life stories were the most testing. So thousands of kids who are maybe unaware of their own potential can see just what can be achieved. There are 10 awards and, in addition to highlighting sporting excellence, they also acknowledge personal challenges and overcoming adversity, with titles such as Love of Life and Twist of Fate, giving an insight into how these awards are uniquely tailored to the athlete's experiences. I think this is a great event, and I think these kinds of events are good for any athlete, not only winning an award, but simply taking part. So a big thank you to the organizers and the Paralympic and Olympic committees for making sure Paralympic sport is not seen as second best to Olympic sport. Russia has 107 candidates for the final team of 64, who will be taking part in Sochi next February. And they'll be followed by over 600 Paralympians all vying for one of the record 72 medals to be won. Slowly but surely, we are getting ready for the Paralympics. We have an extra month as we only start in March, but everything is going according to plan. At Vancouver in 2010, Russia's Paralympians finished second overall, with one less gold than Germany, but more medals than any other country. And this time at their home event, Russia aimed to go one better with the state pumping millions of rubles into the nationwide development of all-access multifunctional sport complexes. 
The growth of the Paralympic movement in Russia wouldn't have been possible without the proper infrastructure. That's why we set out to invest further in new facilities that can accommodate both Olympic and Paralympic athletes. I'm happy to say that regions all across Russia are now opening great venues that are fully acceptable to our Paralympic athletes. So while staging their first ever Winter Olympics has long been expected to make the nation proud, the hosting and achievements of the Paralympics could leave a lasting impression. Awards recognizing athletes' achievements throughout the year are always important. And for Russia's Paralympic athletes, it's also the final time they can get together ahead of the upcoming winter season. And with this season's big prize being Sochi, there may well be a Paralympic champions among them come next year's awards. Michael Kravchenko, RT, Moscow Region. Now, for every sporting champion, there are many who'll never have the chance to fulfil their potential. So the Laureus World Sports Academy, along with stars like tennis legend Boris Becker, have set out to help disadvantaged kids get involved in sport. Richard Van Portfleet reports. And the Laureus Academy has chosen Jessica Ennis. The Laureus World Sports Awards are known globally for honouring the best sportsmen and women. Olympic sprint champion Usain Bolt is a three-time winner. And pole vault world record holder Yelena Isimbayeva has won two awards. Yet the organisation isn't just about rewarding superstars. The Loris Sports Academy was set up in 2000 to harness the power of sport to promote social change and celebrate sporting excellence. Its members include some of the biggest names, such as six-time tennis Grand Slam winner Boris Becker, who thrilled the children with his table tennis and badminton skills at a recent event here in the capital. Well, I'm one of the founding members, 43 of us, uh, 13 years ago, uh, and our honorary president, Nelson Mandela, uh, said in his remarkable speech that sport has the power to change the world, and we took it to heart. Uh, we've grown, we've got bigger. We've got over 110 projects now in uh, 50 countries. Russia's one of them. That's uh, the only project here in Moscow, and I'm very proud to be part of it. This program was also the first held in the Russian capital and part of a widening scale of the sports academy's activities, which especially help young athletes with disabilities. Rugby union legend and former All Blacks captain Sean Fitzpatrick was also a guest of honour and only too happy to pass on his knowledge. Uh, we were very fortunate that sport uh, changed our lives. We were given an opportunity and that's what we're trying to do uh, globally. Uh, there's 46 of us and we're trying to give children an opportunity in, in sport. And our, our, our motto is that sport has the power to change the world and uh, we believe that is, that is the case. The organisation has raised 16 million euros for good causes, while four-time Olympic gymnastics champion Alexei Nemov became a member in 2010, the only Russian on the panel. And he's helping to raise the group's profile across his home country for its Special Olympics program, with activities in 62 regions and involving 110,000 children. It goes without saying that the sportsmen who gave the masterclass today are famous around the world. It's one thing to watch them on television, but it's something completely different when you're able to see them in the flesh and ask them questions, or take a picture with them or ask for their autograph. This is something that the children who took part in the event will remember for the rest of their lives. Nemov hosted a gala evening to round off the day's event, which will hopefully become a regular fixture on Moscow's sporting calendar, as well as encourage a new generation of sports lovers as Russia prepares to host the Winter Games and the Paralympics. Richard Van Portfleet, RT, Moscow. And that's all the sport. Bye for now.